right, so what I want to do right now is to go over the material that was in Chapter 10 in the book. Some of this will be reviews, some of it we have not talked about before, and at least a portion of it that's in here is just terminology. You notice that it's very small as far as the number of topics. They talk about inheritance, they talk about polymorphism, and they talk about abstract classes. And you can read this yourselves as far as what inheritance is. Now, when most people think of inheritance, you think of genetic inheritance. And I've given this example before. In fact, those of you who are in the uh, Java class probably remember me saying this earlier in the semester, that like it or not, it, it pretty much is a, is a genetic fact that if a guy with a big nose gets married to a woman with a big nose and they have a child, there's at least a chance the child will have a big nose. Probably a better than average chance. All right, that's typically how genetics works. I know there's always exceptions to everything. I get that. All right, and um, the thing is, so what is what can the child do about it as as she or he gets older? They can live with it or they can get a nose job. Right? I mean, that's about what they. That's really what their options are. It's not like they can just take a nose, you know, snip off the one they have and put another one on whenever they feel like doing it. That's actually what you do when you work with inheritance. So in other words, we didn't do it here, but if you remember, we said that, that for a person, all persons had a name and an address and a phone number, okay? And automatically then, customers got all that name and address and phone number. They got it for free. But if for some reason we wanted to change the, the way that, say, a customer's phone number was done. We could change it inside of the customer class. And if you say, I don't get it, then hopefully you will in a second, but I just wanted to give you like an overview. When you work with inheritance, it's called an is a relationship. Poodle is a dog. A car is a vehicle. Everything that you see on the right of the word is a is the parent. Everything you see to the left of the words is a is the child. Child parent, child parent, child parent, child parent, child parent. All right? And what they're showing here, they're starting to create what's referred to as an inheritance hierarchy. This is a very simple hierarchy because it only has two levels. The top level is always called level zero because remember, we're computer people. We can never start counting with one. So that's level zero and that's level one. So we create an insect class, and if we said all insects have a certain number of things in common, whatever they are, we put all that stuff in there. Then in here, this would be the stuff that would be just, looks like it's, it says bumblebee. I thought it was a, something else. but All right, so that's the stuff that just relates to bumblebees, and that's the stuff that just relates to grasshoppers. But if I define something up here in insect, and I don't like the way it's defined, I can go and override it down here or down here. All right? So think about it. If I was to create what they had right there in the example we just went through was simple, but let's suppose we say that every person has a first name, middle initial, last name, address, city, state, zip, home phone number, work phone number, and email address. We're just going to assume that everybody has that then I would create that in my person class. Then down below, if I created a customer, I would not have to recreate the customer's name, address, city, state, zip, etc., because I already have it. If the only thing that a customer has that's unique is, let's say, a customer number, all right, and maybe uh, a credit limit, that would be all I'd have to add for there. Then I could create another class that was also based off a person called employee. So all employees then would automatically have a, a first name, last name, etc., all that good stuff. But then if I said for an employee, an employee needs an employee number, an employee needs an employee department, and an employee needs some kind of a salary, I could just add that stuff then. So let's say that I do that, and I showed you this example before. Hopefully I'm good. I still have that. All right. So right here, this would be a level two inheritance hierarchy. There's level zero. There's level one. All right. But I could, for example, come down here 
and say, So right now, th what I put up here would be things all bank accounts have in common. The name of the customer, all right, the account number, whatever. Then this would be stuff that would be just for savings accounts, just for IRA accounts, and just for checking accounts. But you know, or hopefully you know, that it's possible that the same bank could have both interest-bearing checking accounts and non-interest-bearing checking accounts. So now I'm at a level zero, one, two. So really I'm at a level three hierarchy. Okay. Years ago I took a class and the guy who taught the class, and again, maybe you've heard this story already, sorry, but the guy who taught the class worked for Johnson Controls in Milwaukee. If you don't know what they are, they, they basically do regulation of uh, thermostats. And they, their, their whole system was written in Java and they wanted it all to be redone because they wanted it to utilize this. And I, I, I remember talking to the guy during the break and saying, you know, that must have been pretty complex. He said, yeah, we were over 500 levels deep in our hierarchy. So you're going from as general as you can to as specific as you can. So for example, you know, let's, let's grab another one of these. And let's say that we had here employee. Well, we have different kinds of employees, right? We might have a salaried employee. We might have a commission employee. We might have an hourly employee. We might have a piecework employee. All right. And then, for example, let's say, let's assume for hourly they could be full time. We're just going to assume just for these, or they could be part time. Hopefully, when you look at this, you realize. Oh, well, all employees have this in common, whatever this is. You only have to define it once. But then as you start getting more and more specific down here, so this right here, anything I define there, should only be things that are, are unique to a full-time hourly employee. Does that make sense? Because if it does, there's no, there's no more to it. And I should be able to change Peaceworker, even if it changed dramatically. And if I change Peaceworker and it has no effect on hourly and it has no effect on salary or commission, that's good. Then what I'm creating between my classes is, what, is what's known as a loose coupling. The relationship between my classes should be loose. And ideally, every class should do only one thing. In other words, this should only involve Peacework employees. This should not involve any other kind of employee. If I've done that, then it's highly cohesive. So you want high cohesion and you want loose coupling when you're setting this stuff up. All right. So they talk about the is a relationship, and they mention that the parent class is usually referred to as the base class, and the child is usually referred to as the derived class. All right. It's possible for a class to be both a parent and a child. I just showed you an example of that. Hourly is a parent to full-time and part-time, Hourly is a child of employee. And again, that's totally legit. This can be as literally as complex as you need it to be. The example they give in here is they use a car. And they say that a car has a make, a model, a mileage, and a price. So they set that up. Bless you. So you've already seen something like this before. All right. And you've seen something like this before. So I'm not going to run through those. Notice they put it on one line. Some people like to do that because it's more compact. I made it bigger just so you could see what was going on. But it's the same stuff we did. It's just I spread this out over four lines and this out over four lines where they put it all in one line. These are what are called the properties. So we're saying all automobiles have a make, a model, a mileage, and a price. Now, they could have more. But as of right now, that's all they have. An object that you create from a class like this only has the abilities that you give it. And it has no more than that.
So the first thing they did up here was they said this was, all right, class automobile. Okay. Then they're coming down here and they're saying a car. And they're saying what's different between a car and an automobile. It's kind of a dumb example, but I, I would have probably called what they called automobile, I probably would have called it vehicle. All right. But they're saying a car as opposed to an automobile has a number of doors in it. So they explain this right here, and this is what I mentioned to you before. Class, and that's the derived or the child colon, and that's the parent class or base class right there. So a car is an automobile. And the examples they've given here are really simple, and it's very similar to the program we did, because what they do here is they have you fill in all this stuff. So you fill in the autos, make, model, mileage, price, and doors. You click create object, and it grabs all the stuff you just created, and it throws it into here. It's very similar to the example we just looked at. there's an example of it. It's almost identical to the program that we just looked at, and he does explain it in here. But now notice, a truck is also an automobile. Again, I would have used vehicle right there, but that's me. Okay, And I would have used vehicle because then I could have added motorcycle. I don't know how you say a motorcycle is an automobile. I don't know how you do that whereas you could say that a motorcycle is a vehicle. And they've got sport utility. So you can make this as complex or as simple as you need it to be. But the thing to realize is when you're working with this stuff, you're doing modeling. All right? And the model that you create only has the abilities that you give it. All right? So if you create a person class and you say a person has a height and a weight, you don't put anything else in there, and you say a person can eat and sleep, okay? Then they have a height and a weight, and they can eat and sleep. They can't drink because you didn't give them that ability. So the, ob the class that you create, of which you're going to create objects, only has the ability to do things that you give it to do, you know, the, the ability that you give it to do. All right. <clears throat> so they do a bank account one in here. But again, it's very similar. He asks you to put in the account number, the interest rate, the balance, and the maturity, the date, and then he explains. This is the, there's actually some really good examples in here because he goes through them line by line. You'll notice in here you put in for an interest rate two and a half, but down here they've got it so that basically they've rounded it to just two decimal places instead of three. And again, I'm not going to be naive enough to say when we get done, hey, does all that make sense? Because if you've not seen it before, it might not make much sense at all. But at least you've been exposed to it. All right, yes. No, you wouldn't be wrong at all. In fact, most, most books will tell you that in the end, when you start writing this code, that bottom line is, for example, with the person and the customer, those would those would be part of a database, and those would each be a table. We've talked a little bit about constructors. Again, remember that a constructor is what's automatically called when you create an object. All right. Since we created that constructor for the person class, but we put no, I'm sorry for the customer class, but we put nothing in it, nothing special happens. In this case, whenever you create one. If you create a new rectangle object and you don't pass it in anything, the length and width are automatically set to zero. But if you pass it in a length and a width, they're automatically set accordingly. There's no, right here in this example, and in the example I gave you, there's no uh, reasonableness checks. I could put in a negative number for the length and a negative number for the width. It really doesn't make any sense. But we could do it if we wanted to, the way that it's currently written. And, you know, when you go through books, a lot of times this is what you're going to find is examples, automobiles, 
and shapes. They're popular as heck for starting to teach people object-oriented programming. So they summarize part one right here on page 611. When you create an instance of a derived class, the base constructor is executed first, then the derived constructor is executed. Okay, what, is it, what the heck does that mean, Jeff? That means that if I create a full-time employee, automatically what happens first is the employee constructor is going to be executed. Then the hourly constructor is going to be executed. Then the full-time is going to be executed. If that doesn't make sense to you, it actually should. Because it says do the stuff for all employees first, then do the stuff for hourly employees, then do the stuff for full-time hourly employees. When you create an instance of a derived class by default, all right, the base class, it's, it's automatically, you don't call the constructor, it's automatically called. All right, and that, that's enough. The rest of it gets a little bit funky, for lack of better words. All right, so let's imagine, I'll give you one more simple example here. Put that way up. And we're going to create a class here, and we're going to call it pet. And we'll put in dog, cat, bird, and goldfish. Goldfish is a weird one, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. All right. So let's say that up in the pet class, one of the things that I put in here is I say that all pets must have a name. In addition, all pets must be able to speak. Again, that's why I said with a goldfish, I don't know how it speaks, but you get the idea. All right? Okay, and let's just say by default, when I call the speak method for a pet, by default it says hello. Well, that doesn't really make any sense because I don't know of any pet that says hello. Okay? But if I say up here for pet that all pets must have a speak method, that means if I want it to, to work correctly, I've got to write a speak method here. And I've got to write a speak method here. And I've got to write a speak method here. And I've got to write a speak method here. Now, in the goldfish's case, I might have it say nothing because it doesn't talk. All right? For the dog, I might have it say bark, woof. It doesn't matter. For a cat, I might have it purr. For a bird, I might have it chirp. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. And let's say then that after I do this, I create some objects. All right? So I say dog. Spike equals new dog. All right, then I say cat fluffy equals new cat. We'll just leave it at that. All right, the system has to know when I go spike dot speak, or if I say fluffy dot speak, if I call this one, it should say bark. Correct? Why should it say bark? It's not a trick question. Why should it say bark? Because it's a dog, right? The same reason that that should say purr. So the system knows, even though I've got a bunch of methods that are all called speak, the system knows which speak method to call based on the context or the type of object I'm working with. Does that make sense? That's polymorphism. That's it. It's a Greek term that means many forms, but it means read it yourselves. All right. And there's really not any more to it than that. Again, they say it's, it's, a, it's an object's ability to take on many forms. And they give you something very similar. They, so they say here, they create a, a thing called species, a class animal. And by default, the sound that it makes is grr. All right. And then they create a dog, and the dog overwrites it Okay, by saying woof. You get the idea. All right. So if we use this example, unless we changed it by default, a goldfish would say grr. Okay.
Okay, I, let, let, me, let me try to answer what I think you're asking, and then you tell me. Okay? Not only would you need a separate one, but you'd come in here and you'd say something like this. Uh, Kali. Dalmatian. So in other words, you'd keep going down. And if there were different kinds of collies, there's a border collie and another kind, you'd keep going down and down and down. Now, do you have to do that? It depends on what it is you're trying to model and exactly how specific you were trying to be. When you, I mean, think about it, just with dogs. I don't know how many breeds of dogs there are. I don't really care. But my, if you told me there were 100, I'd believe you. And under those, there'd be subbreeds. And under those, there might be subbreeds. So the idea of thinking that I'd be able to do this and write this for all dogs and all cats and all birds and all fish, etc. In fact, even more than that, instead of a goldfish, if we made that fish, all right, this could be several hundred layers deep. All right. But again, realize that this whole thing, what you're doing here, is you're doing modeling. So it's going to be as complete as you make it. As I said before, the, these things will only have the abilities you give it. And if you create a really simple hierarchy like this, it may not look like one, but that's a pretty simple one. All right. Then that's all it's going to have. Now think about why you might want to create a simplistic hierarchy. Okay? And if I came down here and went, went down here even further, what if I created something up here? Because this is this is how this stuff is actually used. What I'm going to show you right now. Whoops. So I'm going to say reservation. All right. So somebody contracts me and they're from a, a, a real small car rental place and they want to do a thing they want me to set up a reservation class for them and I do it and I set it up exactly like I've just shown you and let's say it's 10 levels deep I don't care about it. but let's say the first six levels pertain to anything I'm doing a reservation for so it could be a car place it could be a hotel all right it could be something else that's why you write you go from very generic to very specific because now I can sell that because it can be used not only by a car place, but I could use it by another place because we're still doing modeling. That's how this stuff is used and reused. The, the, the concept of object-oriented programming is not new. The first object-oriented programming language is 50 years old this year. It's called Simula 65. 1965 is when it was created. All right, And it never really caught on. But one of the reasons that object-oriented programming catches on right now is it, it, it promotes code reuse. See, whether you like this or not, get used to it. Because when, it, when supervisors hear reuse, they think, oh, that means that we don't have to hire as many employees. You never hear that where we, oh, we don't have to hire as many supervisors, all right? Because it just doesn't work that way. But that's why it's popular and it continues to be popular, are things like code reuse. When, when you take something that was created in a class, for example, like this, speak, and we change it in a class below it, that's called overriding what was in there before. Overriding. So I'm override, I've overridden what was in there before. And they get, they get into this also in here. All right. Isa does not work in reverse. What does that mean? Well, that means, again, a customer is a person but a person is not necessarily a customer. All right. All right. And they give you a polymorphism application where you can create an animal, all right, which is the generic or a dog or a cat, just so you run through all this stuff. And it, again, it sounds real simplistic, and it pretty much is, but that's how you learn this. All right, and the last thing that's discussed in the chapter, starting on page 622, are abstract classes. And I've already kind of mentioned what those are to you. You're not typically going to say some, to somebody, hey, I just got a new pet. Because their first question would be, well, what kind? And you, well, I got a dog. And then again, they might say, what kind? Well, I got a Dalmatian. Well, that's a lot different than them asking you, you instead of saying, I got a new pet, I got a new Dalmatian. If it's a new Dalmatian, they already know it's a pet and it's a dog. All right. 
So if I created a hierarchy and started to do something like this, I would never actually create a pet object because it's too generic in nature. It doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't create an employee because it's too generic in nature. I wouldn't know what kind of employee it was. I wouldn't create a bank account because it's too generic. So those particular classes become what are referred to as abstract classes. You create it so other classes can be created off of it, but you never want to instantiate that class itself. Right? And that's exactly what they talk about in here. So you use the word abstract with them. Now notice if I do this, If I create an abstract class called person and I do this, this is legal. So this says public abstract void do something, paren, paren. What that means is any class, any class, all right, that decides it's going to inherit from person must have a method called do something in it. It must. So when I create Something down below it, you know, I guess you'll see it a little bit later. There must be a do something method in it. I can put anything I want in here. I can put abstract things in here and non-abstract things. As soon as I put the word abstract in, inside of the class here, that class must be abstract. Did everybody hear that? So as soon as I say that a method is of type abstract, it's an abstract method, the class itself must be abstract. If you don't, you're going to get an error message. It doesn't make any sense to the system. So they've got this computer science student application. All right. And what they're saying is all students, regardless of their type, will have a name and an ID number. And you'll notice that if you were in information systems as opposed to software engineering, these will be different. Now let's let's assume, and I, I haven't even I don't remember what this one does, but let's just pretend, for example, that if you're an information systems student for a four-year school, you need 124 hours. If you're a software engineering, you only need 120. So the stuff that's between here would, would basically be identical, but some of the specifics between this one and this one are different. So we could go in there and create an abstract class called computer science student, or student, like they do here. And we put in there that stuff that would be set up for all students. This is any kind of student. So later, if we wanted to come back and have a biology student and an English student, they'd all have a name and they'd all have an ID. So we can keep using that stuff. Again, code reuse. Now you'll notice here under the required hours, notice there's a get. And there's no set. If it's get, that means it's read only. You can't change it. Well, I, you know what, I only want to go to a four-year school for two years. So I want to change that required hours from 124 to 62. I only want to go half that, but I still want the degree. They're not going to let you do that. It's also possible to just have a set when it's write only. All right, typically by default, it's going to be read-write, as you see. And even though they wrote get there, you can still right get you can still say for example here return required hours that's usually the way you see it I don't normally see it just with the word get in there all right so now a computer science student is of type student so you already know this a computer science student already now has a name and an ID and you're able to get and set that name and get and set the ID then you start to put in things there that are this stuff in here is specific to comp sci students Math hours, CS hours, gen hours. So the stuff that we end up writing in here is just specific for that kind of student. And again, as I already mentioned, then we could create an English literature student or whatever else we wanted to create. And guess what? That's it. All right. Now, I will show you this before we finish up. I mean, I'm done, but I just wanted to show you this, and that is... The example that I'm going to give you next week, and again, I'm going to give you all of it. That when we run this one, this is going to look a lot to you like the one that you did for Chapter 7, the U.S. population, except what this example is doing is it's getting its information from a database, not from a text file as you did, 
but from a database. So when you run this, all right, there's the population sorted in ascending, ascending order. See that? How oh, it's going up? There it is in descending order. There it is by the name of the city. There's the total population. There's the average population. There's the city with the highest population and the one with the lowest population. What's, for lack of better words, kind of amazing about this? So you start here on about line 10. Watch as I go down. That's the whole program. It's only about 60 lines. Because what we're doing in here is we're having it come in and there's a database already in here. I mean, what I want to show you, it's not letting me, we'll have to see if we can get that fixed before next class, is that's a database. And it's going to look very, very similar to my SQL database. All right. So we're just calling routines based off of that database. And that's it. So we'll go over that next Monday. Next Wednesday will be lab again. Try to have all work done All right. by no later than like next Sunday. And most of you, you can figure out, you know, there have been five sets of programs in here. All right, and there's six in Java. But in here there's five. And each one has been basically worth 20, 20 points. I go on a 90, 80, 70 system. So if your average is a 90 or above and you've got everything done, you're going to get an A. Does that make sense? Questions? I'm finished.